This is um, the 5th of November 2004 and we're here at uh, Fox Run Village to interview uh, Joseph Dishazy Sr. Uh, I'm Bill Volano and I'm with the Ypsilanti Rotary and we also have Helen Dishazy who's not only Joe's wife but also a member of the Ypsilanti Rotary. And, uh, Good morning, Joe. How are you? Good morning, Bill. It's nice to and, see you. And we, we know each other, so we don't have to pretend to be too formal about <laughs> this. You know, we've known each other for years now. But, uh, and, and you know, you were one of the people that we um, uh, uh, recognized um, last year or the year before. I don't remember which. But, um, so I know a lot about your background, but I, I need to know some some other details like I, I'm not sure I remember when you got into the service how old you were how would you get drafted or did you join where were you by the way well I had uh, become a member of the, uh, the old CCC the Civilian Conservation Corps oh yeah I got shipped from Detroit to uh, uh, near Iron River a place called Gibbs City uh -huh. I signed up three different times uh, for the CCCs and I was there for 16 months and uh, got friends with a boy from the farms and it turned out that he wanted me to finish my high school. Mm -hmm. So he got me to live with them on the board and uh, I went back and finished my, my high school at uh, Trout Creek, Michigan. And uh, it was quite an experience during that period of time. I had turned 17 in December. On January 17th, I was left Detroit. There mm -hmm. I was in the Upper Peninsula. In the January 17th, snow piled way up high. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we got up there with about 70 Detroiters, boys. And uh, we had quite a bit of time. We had a quite a bit of time uh, doing things. Then we got woke him one morning and said, hey, you got to go out into the woods and do some uh, timber standing improvements by TSI. What you have and to do, timber? Timber standing improvement. That means that you went around where the, uh, the evergreens had been planted uh -huh. and you took out all the trees that were of no value around them to release them to light and rain. And as you go across the upper peninsula, you'll see many, many areas that have been planted by the CCCs. Uh, two summers, instead of being out planting trees, I wound up as a fire tower. Man. Oh yeah? Uh -huh. yeah? So I got to see the country from 100 feet above the, <laughs> the earth, but it was very interesting, but of course it could be very dull too, because mm. you couldn't read, you had to keep an eye on Oh, you can't read it? Uh, I was going to say you bring a couple dozen books or something. <laughs> no, no. And you didn't dare go to sleep either. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, but uh, there was a triangulation method with other towers around the countryside if you spotted a, a fire. And that way you could pick it up right down to the nearest 10 feet mm. where a fire was. But you also had to watch out for trains and uh, factories because they had smoke. Smoke, yeah, uh, right. So. Mm. But it was very, very, very interesting and very educational. Yeah. Did you did you go to, the, well, this was before 1941? This was January of 41. January 41? Yeah. What, what happened once the war broke out? Well, I got my notice, uh, my first notice, uh, and what happened was they found out that I was on a farm mm -hmm. and I was finishing my high school. so. It was very nice that they allowed me to finish my high school. And so in August of uh, 41, uh, I got my, or 43, excuse me, mm -hmm. I got my final notice for drafting and uh, went to a Marquette to get all the paperwork taken care of. And uh, within a reasonable length of time, I found myself in Camp Grant, Illinois, uh, being inducted into the Army. One of the things about the fact that I did graduate was 
we went down, I was sent down to Camp uh, Benny in uh, Georgia. Is it your Alabama? I think. Oh, okay. Georgia, Bennington. Bennington. Ben Camp Bennington. Ben Bennington. Oh, okay. Georgia. And anyway, uh, we were st we were about two. We had a camp of about 250 kids, young men. Hmm. And we were found out we were slated for college under a program called ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. Oh, yeah. And after after 13 weeks of training which was four weeks shorter than normal, found ourselves at uh, the University of Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, what we were doing was learning to be the basics of engineering. Hmm. But the problem was, after a period of time, reading the papers, I got uh, an idea that I shouldn't be in these nice, sumptuous, housing and training and stuff and I should be up front with the boys. And so uh, they allowed me to do what I wanted. However, they didn't like it. They wanted me to stay and get my training. But the only way you could do this was to either goof up mm -hmm. or fail your grades classes. This was the course I took. So after a few months I found myself on the way to uh, the Timberwolves, 104th uh, uh, Army Division, uh -huh. down in the deserts of California, Arizona, in their maneuver area. And the funny thing about that was we got down yeah. there and we were all AST peers. Oh, is that right? And uh, we were replacing necessary people that they needed and we got greeted by the uh, local veterans very very nicely they greeted us with open arms mm -hmm. m1s 45s <laughs> <laughs> but and they gave us a rough time because we were college boys but we and and they were our, they were already they were regular armies they, right? well this was the 104th division uh -huh. they, there and they were finishing up their training so we got about two weeks of training then we moved up to uh, Camp Carson, Colorado Springs, mm -hmm. which was very wonderful. From February through August, uh, training to be night fighters. In fact, our, excuse me, in fact, our 104th was known as the night fighters. Every attempt, every attack I was ever involved in took off somewhere around 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we we wound up in France, and from France, we jumped off in battle formation from the outskirts of Belgium, fighting in Holland. And we released, uh, of course, naturally many towns, but the one that was important up there is we fought for the release of the port of Antwerp. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, after that, uh, the, uh, and by the way, the Dutch have always been one of our most staunchest allies and one of our best friends. We've had many, many people from their uh, government over the years who would come and speak at our reunions. I, I've heard that before, Joe, that uh, I was talking with a paratrooper or a former paratrooper, and he said when he was in, you know, uh, in one of the Holland battles. He said there were people in the in the fields who were jumping and dancing and everything else and were so happy and you know, really. That is true. In fact, we had quite a few exchange students and we had one that was very important to us. Their family became our best friends. In fact they visited us visited us over here. And every time we flew into airport there in Holland, they would come and pick us up and take us wherever we mm -hmm. wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hans uh, kind of lost track of them over the last couple mm -hmm. of years, but they have been very, very wonderful people. Mm -hmm. Was it, well, did, well, um, Antwerp had to be freed in order for it to 
to get supplies and things well, of that sort. Uh, the problem with that was we needed the port of Antwerp to get our major supplies instead of sending them down to Normandy and places like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we helped to fight and uh, liberate the port of Antwerp. From, uh, from Holland we went to uh, Aachen, Germany. And uh, we relieved the, other, the first division, and, uh, which is very funny because the man who had brought the first division, our general, all of, the, of ours became, was at one time their general. Oh, yeah? Uh -huh. So it was very, very strange that we had this connection. But anyway, we. Uh, we finally took the port of Avaca and we uh, fought west, eastward, my yeah, yeah. eastward, releasing many towns. And we crossed the Roar River. And uh, after we crossed the Roar River, a town called Ellen, Germany, we attacked there. And about two o'clock in the morning, I was wounded. And uh, right, tell us about that. That's well, the, the, the bad part about that was I was a mortar, 60 mortar squad leader, 60 millimeter, and uh, the fellow who was my base plate man, I, I carried the barrel and uh -huh. carried the base plate, and I had three ammunition bearers. Well, we, we, we couldn't go down the road because it was an 88 firing at us, so half of us went to the left and the right of this uh, road, and in doing so, we crossed a little stream, which had become quite large because of they had blown the dams. And uh, we got it. We, in the middle of this was a uh, fence, so we had to climb over this fence. Well, I got over, and the guys behind me, of course, started coming over. So I went across the river, and we got to the edge of the town. And I turned around and I said to my my base plate man, I said, you need to set up. He says, I dropped the base plate. I said, what do you mean you dropped the base plate? How come you didn't tell me? He said, when I climbed over the fence, I dropped it. He said, I couldn't find it. He said, I just kept on coming. Well, a mortar barrel without a base plate, I don't care what they say in the movies and, and uh, some of these people, it is very useless. So I said, okay, you guys wait here and I'll go back and see if I can find it. Well, I got back and crossed into that uh, stream, got onto this little island like there where the fence came across. And we couldn't find it on this side. So I started to climb over and as I got to the top, I was hit by a mortar shell. And I fell down on the other side. And uh, see now this was about it must have been about 2.33 o'clock in the morning. Good morning, everybody. And uh, what happened was there was a shell hole near the uh, fence. So I, but it was half full of water because after all, this was in the middle of a stream. And uh, after a period of time, I kind of, my uh, sergeant came came along. And of course, I we had a, K, uh, code called Keiko, which was Keiko. And so every once in a while I would yell out Keiko. Well, he finally heard me. He said, Joe, he said, we can't come and get you. He said, because we're still fighting for the town. Well, believe it or not, this lasted all night long, the rest of the night. So about 8.30 the next morning, uh, the sergeant appeared and he says, I'll get some guys and we'll come out and get you. So a few minutes later, he showed up with four of our people with a stretcher. And what had to happen was they had to cross the, from the town, they had to cross and come along this river, and that I would be there, the stream. And the funny part about this, the unfunny part, was as they got near me, all of a sudden a shot rang out. Somebody was shooting at them. And fortunately, they missed him, whoever it was. System. So they retreated, of course, and about a half an hour later, they came back again with a stretcher and four of the Germans. And we, they had figured, well, they wouldn't. This guy turned out to be a sniper; would not shoot at them. 
So they got almost to me again, and again the shot rang out. Another shot rang out. Did they shoot the Germans? <laughs> they shot at them. At them, uh-huh. I don't know if anybody was hit or wounded, but they retreated again. Because after all, you know, I've been there for several hours and I'm wounded. <clears throat> and so I'm in and out all night long, and the rest of the, you know, this period of time. So they, what they did this time was, when they came up with the four prisoners, they had some guys watching the town, on the edge of town. And they, they must have spotted them because, oh, about an hour or so later, they came back again, no shots. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why, but this guy, whoever he was, a sniper, never killed me yet when he chances to. Well, you were he, good bait. Well, I was, I was, good, I was good bait, but mm -hmm. you see, it is strange that people think of people being killed. But the worst thing that can happen to you is have wounded people, especially for our, our people because of the way you did things. Yeah. And so it took more t fuss and muss to get, get me than it was to be killed. Well, anyway, it turned out they must have gotten me in there. I think they turned out, he turned out to be in one of the steeples on the edge of mm. town, one of the churches. And they must have, I think, I think that they used a bazooka to take out the steeple. Take him out, yeah. yeah. And so they came back and got me and uh, picked me up. And of course, now again, I'm still in and out. And oh, by the way, I had used my belt as my tunic. Mm -hmm. So when they picked me up, I wound up and they came to again. I'm on the stretcher on the Jeep. So <clears throat> now here's a very strange thing that happened. Now stop and think, here I'm wounded. I'm, put on, I'm, I'm looking at the sky, I'm on a stretcher, I'm looking at the sky. I go back to battalion A, <clears throat> and they took a look at me, I'm still looking at the sky. They put me on a train, I'm looking at the sky, the ceiling. I get into Paris, and they, they uh, took care of me there temporarily. Looking at the ceiling, they fly me over to Oxford, England, to a to a hospital. Again, I'm looking at the ceiling. I get into the hospital, and of course, all this period of time, I'm looking at the ceiling. And the funny part about this is, and it was usually the women, because they were the most interested. Joe, how did you like England? <laughs> well. Same way I like Paris. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, another thing happened uh, after after I had been put into a cast. The cast ran from my left ankle all the way up to here. And uh, after about three months uh, uh, being in England at the hospital, I now would want to go back home. And so they put me on a uh, boat. It was part of a convoy. And uh, now remember, I'm in this big body cast. I can't move. We get out and see about, I think, it was even I think it was the second day, all of a sudden our motor stops in the boat. And of course, all I can think of was here. <laughs> all I can think of was, here comes the possibility of submarines. And I'm in this doggone <laughs> cast. It doesn't float very well. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. Anyway, they, uh, after about, I think it was about four or five hours, uh, they got it going again, and we finally caught up to the convoy again. Because remember, the convoy, they keep on going. Mm -hmm. and here we are all by ourselves on this hospital ship in the middle of the Atlantic, you know, thinking about all these submarines that could be out there. But we, we got back to, we were near the city of uh, New York, and we went from a Funny thing here was we went from a blackout phase where we had to cover the windows and all that sort of what they call a brownout. And uh, so some of the things would be covered, some wouldn't be. Anyway, we got into the port of uh, New York. I was put on a train and they had asked me where I wanted to go. And I said, well, I've got a girlfriend in California, 
uh, I want to go to California. So I wound up at uh, Camp uh, Logic in, in Southern California, about 80 miles east of uh, San Diego. Uh -huh. So now, again, I'm still in the cast. But what they did here now was they removed that cast, put me in a very, the same kind, but a, a more uh, comfortable cast. More flexible? More, well, it wasn't, there was nothing flexible. No? <laughs> but one of the funniest things that happened was in the bed, you had what they call the monkey bars, you know, yeah. a couple ropes that came mm -hmm. down with a, you would grab onto this and do the exercises and pull yourself up and stuff. There was one nurse who I got along with very well because she liked puns. But anyway, this one day I pulled myself up and I'm like this, and of course there's nothing down here, and you look right down. And I said, I, and we were talking, I said, well, I don't know if any gal is going to walk me with my broken leg and everything. She's standing there like this, and she says, oh, from where I stand, she says, it looks pretty good. <laughs> looks pretty good. But uh, I stayed there, recuperated. And uh, I got out. I'd been into San Diego many times, but I had to go to Los, near Los Angeles where my, at that time, my girlfriend was. But they came and asked me, or told me about the fact that I could go to college. Where would I want to go? And I said, well, I'll have to do some thinking about that, or do some checking. So I went to uh, the library at the hospital they had a book on all of the colleges in the U.S. And I was, had been in the CCCs, so I was interested in woods, trees, and stuff like that. And so I looked and well, lo and behold, Michigan State at that time, I you remember know, this was 19, in the 1940s, had a reputation as being one of the best, if not the best, forestry College or had the forestry program that was one of the best in the nation. Joe, I'm going to have to pause here for just a second, if that's okay with you. Okay. Um, there we go. We're back on okay. camera. And of course, being a Michigander uh, all my life, and uh, this was Michigan State, which was north of Detroit, or east, I should say, northeast of Detroit. Northwest. Northwest. My, there we go. Yep. There goes my directions again. <laughs> anyway, I went. Uh, that's how I got into Michigan State, and I was in the forestry program. <clears throat> yeah. Be, before we get too far away from from Europe, um, okay. I wanted to ask you first of all, how old were you when you were wounded? Uh, this was February twenty fifth, nineteen forty five, and. So at that time, I was see, 23 from 45. I was 23 years old. You were 23? Yeah. So, so you, you were one of the seniors in your office. Well, remember, I got in when I turned 19. Yeah. So uh -huh. After I had turned 19, and got in when I was 20. So. Uh, you were, you, you had um, listed that you had liberated a camp. Uh, well, this was after. This. This was before you got wounded. No, all of the list that I had given you about uh, the, th the high points of what I consider yeah. our, mm -hmm. our uh, regiment, 415, uh, starting out with, the, with Holland and the liberation of yeah. Fort Edward, mm -hmm. uh, I, when we crossed the Royal River, as I said, and I got wounded at Ellen, which, by the way, was my sister's name. Oh, and I wrote and told her she'd have to change her name. <laughs> uh, she uh, she said nope. <laughs> wrote me back and said nope. <laughs> so anyway, uh, one of the things that, besides that little thing, was the fact that my unit, most of the guys, believe it or not, in my weapons platoon, I was the, in the mortar, there were also machine guns. Almost all of them came through. In fact, three of them have silver hearts, silver 
stars from the actions that they had taken. But when there was one time when we were in uh, Sully in Holland, and remember, remember now, I, 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 was, I was head of this mortar squad, but this was before that, and I was the gunner. So the mortar squad. And uh, my, I had been in college, and I needed glasses. So they got me glasses, but they turned out to be bad. I had two pair of very bad uh, glasses. And at this time, I remember, I wanted to get out. So there I was, here I'm now in the Army, and I've got bad eyesight. Well, actually, it's right on the verge of needing glasses. So this one time, the sergeant, when we were attacking, the sergeant came up and says, OK, Joey, he says, set up. So I set up. He says, OK, see that tree out there? <laughs> he says, I said, what tree? <laughs> well, I won't tell you what he said, but <laughs> Yeah, he got it aimed properly, and uh, but it was so funny that they wouldn't give me glasses, but they would if I was still in the in the college. So I went through the whole war without glasses. Mm. <laughs> so one time when I was at Michigan State, I go into the dentist's office get my glasses, and when I pick them up, I'm wearing them. Of course, I go outside and I said, "My gosh." You mean this is what I was supposed to be seeing all this time? <laughs> but there are always there were things like that. Yeah. Uh, take take me back to to um, your your unit in in Europe. You were you were in a unit that was in continuous battle for well, as it turns a long out, time. according to our records. Now remember, this is the entire. Red, uh, 104th. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, there are three regiments, so of course there were about 15,000 people, plus all the ancillary units, MPs, uh, <coughs> gunners, and sure. uh, anti-aircraft. So about another 5,000. So we were 20,000 people, <coughs> and uh, we. Uh, I've lost my train of thought. Well, I was I was asking oh, yeah. about. You know, how long in continuous battle was the unit? Myself, uh, I was in continuous battle, a contact with the enemy for 120 days. The unit was in contact 195 days. Now, when I say continuous contact, that means that the enemy is always in front of us. We're sending out patrols, we're attacking, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by continuous contact. Mm -hmm. Because people are going to say, what do you mean you fought for 195 mm -hmm. days? Well, you weren't always fighting, but you were always in contact. In contact, absolutely. As I yeah. said at night, I'd, I'd been on a couple of these patrols going out and trying to capture them. So, <coughs> anyway. Uh, capture them and bring them back for intelligence, you mean? Well, if we got any, we got one one time of the two, the two times that I had gone. But I'll tell you, that was. That was scary. I don't care what anybody says. Here you are, you're going, oh, by the way, this is when we were along the Roar River. I'm crossing the Roar River, or parts of it, to try and get some people, enemy, for interrogation. But we uh, remember of that 120 days, I then spent all that time in, in the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. So. One of the funny things that happened was I had a very good friend, and I still do. Uh, his name is Mike Dorsch. He was in one of the rifle platoons. And in our battles in Aachen that we were involved in, there was a certain fence, or I should say, uh, not fence, uh, made out of stone. And the funny part about that is, he has relatives in Germany, because uh, his last name, of course, is German, and uh, Dorsch. And uh, he somehow really came in contact with, with a friend of a relative, and through conversations and stuff, turned out this guy had been in Aachen and had been one of our enemies firing back at us at that mm -hmm. time. Uh -huh. Now, here he is after the war. He's over there visiting with the guy. 
So that was most interesting. Yeah. Small world. Now you got to the Alb, uh, Alb River, Alb, <coughs> no, River, pardon me. Well, again, the list I gave you would end at Ellen after 120 days. <coughs> Remember, mm -hmm. I'm talking about 195. Yeah. Okay. So that last period of time, they had been, my outfit had been in contact with the enemy, of course. But remember the Remagen Bridgehead? Yeah. Well, we were up there near, on the other side of uh, Aachen, going west, or east. And uh, in their attacks, they finally took the town of Cologne with the 3rd uh, Armored Division. They uh, captured Cologne. Uh -huh. Well, remember now, at this period of time, the Magen came into view, and so they sent my unit, my division, down to the Magen, and our people crossed there, across the uh, bridge before it collapsed. Uh, now the slave camp, that was, I was trying to remember the name of it. Uh, so, uh, Nordhausen sticks in mind, but I, mm -hmm. anyway, but they did release a slave camp, and they can say that it was one of the most ghastly things they had ever come across because of the way the people looked and how emaciated they were and bodies and stuff like that. But, by the way, when they had uh, helped capture the Roar Valley, which as you know was very important to Germany, after that they went attacked towards Berlin, but they, when they got to the Elbe they were held up and they couldn't go to Berlin, as you know, because of political reasons. They met the Russians on the Elm, so that was one of the things that happened to our people. And that was, of course, turned out to be the, near the end of the war. So. And by the way, they were slated to go to Japan. In fact, they were in California getting ready by cleaning their, their, their guns and, and uh, their jeeps and their trucks and stuff. You mean, you mean the, the uh, 104th, 104th was... That's to go to Japan. Japan. They were on the, they were there and getting ready to go to Japan when the war ended. So they uh, they lucked out on that. I bet you they were pretty thankful too. Oh yeah. Huh? yeah. Uh, you know we'd heard a, an awful lot about and read an awful lot about the battles that they'd had over there, all those islands, and now we're going to go into Japan. And of course they were going to fight to the bitter end. Mm -hmm. So glad things happened. Yeah. That the emperor finally stepped in and said, "Okay, this yeah. is it," and he stopped. Uh, well, after all this, and you went home and got back into Michigan State University yep. in forestry. Is that what you said? Yep. Now because you were you were discharged then. Yes. Well, I was. Uh, as, I, as you know, why I was over there anyway. Uh -huh. But of course, I had to come back because I had. I was going to go to uh, Michigan State. And that turned out to be a goof because when I got there in September, they, I, you know, I went to the office and I said, well, here I am. And the gal behind the desk, she said, okay, who are you? <laughs> so it turned out that they had goofed with their paperwork and I was scheduled for, for February of 1947, not 46. So I had to go back home to the Upper Peninsula where I had stayed to finish my high school. And uh, I worked for the son of the man, the guy who was running the farm, mm -hmm. who was in Escanaba. And I set uh, bases for oil, uh, oil, uh, well, oil uh, exploration. The, uh, yeah. the big. Oh, yes. Okay. I dug basements for people to put in their walls, mm -hmm. uh, drove a 1930, 1931 truck, dump truck, mm -hmm. I think it was 30, maybe it was 40, uh, but it still had the temperature gauge up on the, oh, yes, <laughs> the, hood, of, yeah. the hood of the uh, uh, truck. That was, that was a lot of fun, but it didn't last long because I was doing all these different things. In fact, one time, I was in the basement of a school up there, and believe it or not, I had to take this jackhammer in the basement now, behind the, uh, the furnace, lift that doggone thing up, and drill, 
into the wall to cut a hole. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, those things are hard working. Of course, again, I was young. I've completely recovered. But, but as far as the as far as uh, school was concerned, <coughs> when you went back to Michigan State, you were really you were older than most of the seniors. Oh yeah. Well, a yeah, funny thing happened there too. I can tell you. Michigan State was relative was very small at that time. But in September of '46, 9,000 veterans went to Michigan State and registered. Okay, that's 9,000. Remember. When I got there in 47, there were 6,000 more. So as you see, state grew by leaps and bounds. In fact, I was in the uh, gym, and uh, one of my, they had these lockers, and my bed was the, was the third tier of a bunch of bunks, <laughs> which didn't last long, but that's where I, we got it. Anyway, I, uh, we got into the Quonset huts, but of course, being in forestry, what happened there was, I I was there five years, and I got two degrees. I got a BS degree, Bachelor of Science. Yes, I. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also got a fifth or a, a, another degree because I completed a fifth year of uh, learning organization and uh, the paperwork of being a forester. Then I, of course, I graduated, and uh, they wanted me to go out to California as a forester. That was where the position opened up. And uh, but I kept checking, and being a veteran, I was in the top group of graduate foresters. And the position opened up <coughs> in the downtown Lansing at the forestry office to be a survey uh -huh. man, so we had a group that went up, we went up in the uh, northern part of the state uh, doing forestry work there. And uh, what came in handy there was some of my training in, in the Army, mm -hmm. was going through swamps, yeah. streams, and all that sort of stuff as you're running a line. So that uh, came in handy there too. And. Uh, my sojourn in the Army, I think I'm on the side that said that was a doggone, I wouldn't want to do it again. Uh -huh. That was a doggone good thing. And even though I was wounded and it hurt my ability to be play baseball and basketball and even football while I was there, uh, it, it stood me in good stead as to the brain work up here. So you think that as far as you were concerned, you really and a lot of it, you took away a lot of training. knowledge, training, training advantages from being in the service. Yes. And remember, that was quite a period of time in the history of the U.S. Yeah. We had come through the Depression. And now we were, and remember, even then, we were still in the doldrums insofar yeah. as our economy was concerned. Of course, it was World War II that brought us out. But to me, my training uh, and my training in the CCCs mm. really coordinated with yeah. each other and uh, did me, stood me in good stead in other things too. Yeah. T tell me, Joe, how, how were you received when you got out of service by other people? Uh, you know, we hear about the Vietnam business, but how, how were you received both in the general population? And at the university? Well, oh, ha. we were treated very well by the administration. And, but I meant to say this before when I was talking about Michigan State. I remember 9,000 veterans in September, yeah. 6,000 in February, and they wanted us to wear beanies. <laughs> <laughs> the old college uh, bit. <laughs> So they knew what they they knew what they could do with their beanies, and uh, so anyway, it was it was a it was a wonderful time in my life. And of course, 
And while at Michigan State, I met my wife. Well, that made it wonderful too, sure. And we uh, shared a lot of things. A lot of things in my you're, life. You're, you know, I, I was talking with Helen. You're married now for 56 years. Is that yep, 56. 56? Beat me by six. Um, you have two two children. A boy and a girl. There are no other kind. <laughs> no. I'll have to pardon this <laughs> phrase. I come from a very big Catholic background, although I was never a Catholic. Oh, you weren't. Kept telling me, kept telling me, how come oh. you don't have more kids? Oh. Oh. I said I got a boy and a girl. I said, what other kind are there? <laughs> there was no. How many grandkids do you have? Nine. We have three in Arizona. Uh huh. We have Eight. three. We have three in Arizona, we have huh? three in uh, Wisconsin, and two here in Michigan, oh. in Redford. Eight. Uh -huh. So we have a total of nine. Eight. Eight. Six. Oh, the, oh, Eight. The, okay. Right. So okay. Nine, that's, way. okay. Hey, that's okay. <laughs> I think. Maybe I'm... You're hoping. So three, six, seven, eight. Right. Yeah. When you... When you took the job in, in Lansing and you got into forestry, did you... Is that what you stayed in through your work life? No. In fact, I worked for the state of Michigan in forestry work, doing surveying out in the woods and stuff mm -hmm. like that uh, for 16, 14 months. Uh -huh. And meanwhile, uh, my brother told me that he had a he had a guy down in the bomber plant, well it used to be the bomber plant at Ypsilanti, uh -huh. and uh, he uh, talked to me into coming down there and talking to them, and I became a, what they call the graduate in training, college graduate in training. So for a year I went through all the various departments, and what was strange at that time, I remember, I called it a bomber plant, this is where Henry J. had all of his they had, uh, Ford had all of his uh, B-24s. Yeah, right. And Henry J had taken over and he was making the his car line. So we were taking over from them. And so I got in and, if you'll pardon the expression, the ground floor. Ground floor really. yeah. Just because, after Kaiser Fraser left, you mean? Yeah, as, he, as they were leaving, we were moving in. They'd, they'd clear out a bay, we'd move in. They'd clear mm -hmm. out a bay, we'd move in until we went through the whole plant. There, was, there were three million square feet. Well, remember, I'm a college graduate in training. One of my first big jobs was to go around that whole three million square feet and plot all of the rescue equipment, the stretchers and uh, stuff like that, on a map. So I <laughs> talk about being in on the ground floor, three million square feet. Okay, so I got, I was then assigned to what they call the master mechanics department. I called them Master Maniacs <laughs> after my year was over. And uh, I eventually got into quality control and I was head of that. We would tear down six, tran um, in the garage they would tear down six transmissions every day. Take a look at the parts and they would give me the bad ones. And I had a room I had set up where we'd go in there and I would set these all up. I had the charts on their back there. Mm -hmm. Quality control. <coughs> now, this, this was all for Ford Motor Company. No, no, this this was GM. I'm sorry. Oh, GM. I'm sorry. No. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I took that for granted. No, my it's GM. Yes, Gen I'm sorry. Yeah, General Motors. Right. And so I was there, and at that time, the whole transmission, its driving parts and everything, were made out of metal. They were going to the use of oil to drive the uh, transmission. And uh, I remember I, I said I was, I was uh, quality control. I also had control, uh, control, I had, had to keep the figures for total number of manpower, 12,000 some hundred, while we were making this metal part of the transmission. My boss, we started to lay off people because it meant that all these people in the, in doing the work on the, the metals 
on the lathes and stuff like that. My boss says, Joey says, you're okay. He says, till we get it on down around 7,000. He says, I don't think we'll get that far. But we made it. Pull under 7,000, and I got the X. Oh, yeah? Well, over the next period of time, I spent five years at, well, I went to a couple uh, independents. But I went to next uh, five-year periods for 50, about 15 years. I spent five years at GM. Five years at Chrysler, five years at American Motors. I was in the refrigeration division and Kelvinator International. And uh, so then a couple a couple times I went through some independence. Now see by now I'm a quality control manager. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I got hired, fired, mm -hmm. hired, fired. So what it was, they were, they were using my brain power to set up the quality control division. And as soon as I did that, they got rid of a high paying officer and they, what they would do it, get somebody from the inspection division to take over because after all, I'd set up everything. So all they had to do was make sure it ran. Did so you, I, did but, you, were you able to retire from one company or? I got an email the other day about uh, Adrian Harms. Yeah. Okay, we're back. <laughs> it's a busy place, quite frankly. Uh, where were we? Well, well. Uh, okay. I, I'm sorry. She she made me lose my train of thought. Yeah, we we were uh, talking about whether you were retired from any. Oh yeah. So yes, okay. So after all of these layoffs, I got sick and tired of being laid off and all that sort of stuff. And uh, you know, last, last one in, first one out. First so, one out, yeah. So I said, well, I'm going to look into teaching. So I went to the Wayne University downtown Detroit because remember now I'm now in the Detroit area. And uh, they wanted me to take two more years of, which was the worst one, of uh, algebra. Take all of my advanced stuff all over again. I'd had one year. And I said, no, this is crazy. So I went to Michigan State the next day. Half hour after I got there, half hour after I got there, I had my entire program. I'd gotten, uh, assigned to Michigan State, all the programs and everything. Mm -hmm. So when I got home, I went to the local school system. I got my training school set up on my own. I got, it for them. I got my mentor and uh, I went back and, and got my teaching certificate. And basically, uh, basically with the K through eight, mm -hmm. and uh, but remember now, I'd had a lot of uh, people don't know it, but forestry has an awful lot of math and science, mm -hmm. and uh, in fact, I took an interview once with a guy from Ford Motor Company the, from the engine division. And by the time I got through telling him how much science and stuff I, background I'd had, he said, Joe, he said, I'd like to hire you. But he says, remember when you walked in? I said, I couldn't. He says, well, I was interested. Why was a forester major mm -hmm. doing here in an engine plant wanting a job? Mm -hmm. Well, by the time I got through with him and my experience and everything, he said, I wish I could hire you, but yeah. I told you when you walked in, I, I had no openings. OK, so I got my teaching certificate. I got my training school and uh, in Farmington Hills. I got my uh, mentor who had spent five years in Detroit was now uh, teaching in, in uh, farm, the Farmington, Farmington Hills school system. Mm -hmm. I got my uh, training and wound up getting, now remember this was 1970, uh, 1970s, especially 1970. They were saying that Getting jobs was tough, even though they needed people. Well, it turned out I was a man. 
I'm looking for a job for K through eight, especially the, the middle level. So I had a, I got a contract within just a few days. But I kept looking because I didn't want to teach the whole grade, sixth grade. I didn't want to teach all those subjects. I wanted math and science. So I go to uh, Plymouth. I go in and I talk to the guy in the head honcho there. He says, you know, he says, uh, the guy next door where they park all the buses, it's East Middle School, he says, I'd like you to talk to the uh, principal. I walked in, believe it or not, five minutes after I met this man, Carl, Carl Taylor, I liked him very much, okay? And it turned out he liked me, so I walked out there with another teaching certificate, but to teach the sixth grade and teach, well, I was to teach only math and science. The problem was, the guy who was teaching math and science wasn't going to retire until the next year. He says, how do you feel about teaching language arts? Well, I've, I've got two, two college degrees, I've got all of this experience. Ah, what the heck. Okay, so for a year I taught the language arts, which is reading, writing, spelling, and all that sort of stuff. And I really liked it. I had a good time. So the next year I took a math and my math and science, and I did that for the next 19 years, teaching math and science, and I had a wonderful time. And you re you retired from which well, school system? the problem was <clears throat> we were down, my wife and I were enjoying our 40th wedding anniversary with a party over there in Dearborn in the Clinton Inn Hotel. And having a wonderful time with about 40 of our very good friends over the years. And so we packed up everything after it was all over. And I'm on my way back home with my wife. And uh, the guy was darting, turned up, very heavy traffic, but this guy was darting in and out of traffic. And uh, a little while later, just a matter of minutes, we came upon this same guy sideways to the, the center, center area where they have these concrete things. And he's, he's, lying, he's trying to get out. So I pull over and I stop. And uh, another guy pulled up and stopped. And we, we get the traffic flowing past this, this wreck. And uh, so I, he's watching the traffic, supposedly. And I go to the car, this uh, was a pickup thing. His doors had been jammed, so I couldn't get out. So I tried to get pull one, and we couldn't open it between us. So I said, well, let's try the other side. So as I started to go around the front, I got to where the bumper was. Drunk came out of the crowd, because he thought there was an opening there between this thing and the traffic. And the next moment, there I was lying on the ground a busted leg and winding up in the hospital. So anyway, after after 19 years this happened, and in order to teach sixth graders, you've got to be mobile, especially teaching math and science. Because one moment they're the best of friends, and the next moment they're trying to knock them, each other's heads off. So if you have them up at the board, blackboard, which I used to send them to, do their math. When you go from here, I have to get way over there, back over here. You never knew what was going to happen. So I tried to teach after that on the crutches, but it was not fair Didn't to mean. not only me, but it wasn't <laughs> fair to the kids. So after trying the rest of that year and the beginning of the next year, I called it quits, so in, in January 1990, I retired. And here we are. Yeah. After all you've been through in Europe and everything else, you had to come here to Michigan and trying to help somebody out in order to get really banged up. Well, Bill, 
that's what. Yeah, sure. Man. And 